It's the wildfire that just won't quit. Two months after it started, it makes a run today toward Fort Collins and Loveland. An anti-masker protest near a ballot drop box. Why it wasn't against the law. Hey, find your ballot. We're gonna explain two more confusing ballot issues. Then you can make your choice. And let's do something great together tonight to help new Coloradans who came here fleeing danger abroad. A chance to make them feel welcome in their new home. Because this is next. The Cameron Peak Fire is burning aggressively just up and over the hill from Fort Collins and Loveland. It's been chugged along up there for two months. It's burned more than 135,000 acres. Now, though, it's making an ugly move down toward that part of the Front Range. The fire has burned the grayish black area on the map with some hot spots to the east, southeast. The areas in red are the mandatory evacuations, which you see coming right up to the ridge in Horsetooth by Fort Collins. New orders for evacuation include Redstone Canyon, Masonville, and Horsetooth Mountain Park. The areas in, in yellow are areas that have voluntary evacuations. Power's been turned off in some spots as a precaution here, and US 34 is closed between Loveland and Estes Park as it's just being used for the evacuation efforts. High winds got the fire all excited last night and today whipped up that looming plume seen for miles. Jackie sent us these photos from the playground at Centennial Elementary in Loveland. She's more than 30 miles from where that fire is burning. The fire is also threatening Estes Park to the south where a viewer named Barb saw their famous elk and the new addition in the sky. Denver police are not talking about their investigation into a shooting death that involved a security guard working for a company under contract with Nine News. We brought in reporters from our sister stations outside Colorado to cover this story, which involves our station. Jason Whitley, up from Dallas, noticed a new clue in one of the videos from right after that shooting. Right now, legal experts say this case is more complicated than it might appear. A judge gave police and prosecutors more time to detain Matthew Doloff without charging him with a crime. We do know right here, though, that this video is one piece of evidence. It's a clip that was recorded by that nine news producer in the moment that police rushed up to the scene. Remember, Matthew Doloff, that security guard, was contracted by the television station to provide security for that producer. But listen here to what was captured on this nine news iPhone. Magazines, clips for ammunition, perhaps. It's unclear who said that and about whom, but look again at Helen Richardson's images from the Denver Post. That security guard, Matthew Doloff, was not wearing a coat. And that's important because Denver police say they found two guns at the scene, but police have not yet said who the second one belonged to. Here's an independent take on it from Stanley Garnett, the former district attorney in Boulder. What's interesting about this case and the, the lawyers and the police and eventually the courts will have to sort through is if someone is threatening to use mace and then does use mace, to what extent is the other person entitled to respond with deadly force? Or did the other person, the shooter, believe that in addition to mace, there might be deadly force used, et cetera? We have asked several times about who owns that firearm, and Denver police will only say this investigation is ongoing. Tonight, Matthew Doloff spends a fifth night inside the downtown detention center waiting to see whether prosecutors will charge him with a crime. For next, I'm Jason Whiteley. Ballot boxes, there for dropping your ballots, not for political shenanigans. What they call electioneering is illegal within 100 feet of a polling place or a drop box. But how about having a big old protest near a ballot box? It happened in Larimer County. Our Marshal Zellinger got the video, and now you can take a look. Sunday afternoon selfies. People in Larimer County documenting they voted. This video is from the 24-hour surveillance camera required at all ballot drop boxes. This is the Larimer County Courthouse. A group gathered this weekend to protest the state's mask mandate and business restrictions. People continued to drop ballots off as the event happened well within the 100-foot rule prohibiting electioneering. If I had been there and would have been able to talk with these folks, I would have asked them to move outside the 100-foot limit. Larimer County Clerk and Recorder Angela Myers said Technically, it's not electioneering, but not ideal to be that close either. Did you see evidence of voter intimidation? 
I did not. I looked at the surveillance camera. I saw no indication at any time of anyone uh, bothering anybody dropping their ballots. And there were, it was a steady stream of ballots being dropped. But take a look at the man closest to the drop box. Watch his reaction as a voter arrives with a face mask and a face shield. Then watch as the man coughs. 90 seconds later, after these two women drop off their ballots, he coughs again. Oh, I see what you're saying right there. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. If I had been there and able to and knew that someone was right there at that ballot box, I would have been very quick to say that ah, can't be there. Can't be bothering people doing this. Former state senator Kevin Lundberg was the MC of the event. We talked on the phone. He told me the event was not to influence the election, therefore not electioneering, and that he wanted to be sure anyone who wanted to access the drop box could. I also did see this moment where one of the men closest to the drop box actually helped someone locate the slot for the ballot. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. So let's count the obstacles to the U.S. Census this year. She had a fairly hostile Trump administration. You had the pandemic. You had a moving deadline, and you had people's general lack of trust in the census. Our Anusha Roy looks at the obstacles' impact in Colorado's undercounted communities. This year demanded creativity, from weaving information about the census into food banks and COVID testing sites to a mural on the side of the Revision Building in Southwest Denver. We'll identify all the communities in Westwood. Uh, that live in Westwood that are undercounted. The pandemic really hit reaching out to this community's hard. You know, Michael Benitez with MSU Denver said when face to face meetings were ruled out, they pivoted fast to using video chat, social media, art, even online dance parties to build trust and encourage people to fill out the census. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, zip codes uh, with large mm -hmm. immigrant communities, migrant communities, uh, you know, refugee communities. Uh, low income communities. Culturally, there is uh, a very kind of uh, sort of an intimate process of cultivation, of building relationships, of letting them know why they can trust us. One of the many things the census helps decide is how much federal funding states and local jurisdictions get. Having resources like food banks in our communities that are oftentimes funded with government dollars. So immigrant communities might not be able to vote, but if they are counted in the community in which they live, their represent representation should accu accurately reflect their needs. But on top of the pandemic or the changing deadlines from July to October to September, back to October to most recently when the Supreme Court weighed in yesterday, and now the census deadline is October 15th, tomorrow. Reason for wanting to do this is to be a trusted voice in the community to say that it was okay to fill out the census and, and a lot of what it does is like it breaks that trust. The city of Denver has hit its response rate goal of 69.1%. Colorado went up to 69.8% compared to 67.2 in 2010. That we could have done better, maybe even had a significantly higher response rate. So the information is kept confidential and the Census Bureau said as of yesterday, 99.9, .9, more than 99.9% .9 of housing units across the country were accounted for. But we just talked about how that number was lower for Colorado. So how does that math really add up? Well, the census coordinator for the city of Denver said the census has its ways of being able to fill in the gaps of information. More recently, Kyle, that included going door to door. That could include looking at some property records and administrative records. That's just a couple of examples there. So, Nusha, it's kind of like what you do with reporting. You gather the information and then you double check it. Has shifting the gathering later shortened their time to double check stuff? Yeah, it absolutely has because, you know, we were talking about, right, that deadline moving around over the last couple of months. And usually the census will have several months to go through all of their data just to make sure it's accurate. As it stands right now, they have roughly two and a half months. They're worried about that time crunch. And that is also a concern that's been happening for a couple of months now. And I just do want to take this as a moment to remind people that that deadline, though, is still tomorrow. So if you haven't filled it out, you still have a chance to do so. Get after it. Get counted. Helps your community. Helps our community. Anusha, thank you. You all are quickly headed for the $1 million mark in your Word of Thanks micro-giving project. You know how we help out a different Colorado nonprofit each week with an avalanche of our $5 donations? All right, so this week, let's step up together for some Coloradans who are not yet Americans. The Word of Thanks that comes to mind when I think of Project Worth More is welcome. 
For nearly a decade, Project Worthmore has welcomed refugees to Colorado. Families building a fresh start in America get help from this nonprofit so that they can build a foundation for self-sufficiency and success here. English classes help navigating public services, now a food bank too during the pandemic, and a dental clinic. Their goal is to help refugees feel welcome, connected, and ready to thrive on their own in America. Project Worthmore has focused its efforts during the pandemic on single mothers and the elderly who are most at risk. Colorado has about 60,000 residents who came here as refugees. Colorado has always been a magnet for people fleeing dangerous situations around the world, in part because our community has always been so welcoming to refugees. Text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. Thanks to 303-871-1491. I'll shoot you the link to join me in making sure that Project Worthmore can continue to build that stable, welcoming foundation for our newer neighbors, future Americans. You know the deal. If you're good for $5, I'll match the first 50 of those $5 donations. And maybe we can think of it as buying a cup of coffee for somebody who's just come to town and only wants to feel welcome. Thanks. Kind of surreal that we're having a conversation in America about whether a defeated president will give up power. But so long as the president won't give a straight answer, let's examine the possible outcomes. Bubbles are big. My toddler loves them. I'm told adults pop them for stress relief. Basketball players pop bubbly in their bubble. So get in on the bubble trend and fill in some very important ones on your ballot. Side by side, along with us, next. All right, time to get our representative democracy on. We don't have to agree, let's just vote. Hope you're keeping your ballot handy this time each night. If you caught our U.S. Senate debate last night, go ahead and fill in your choice for Senate. You can review the debate and our info on the race at 9news.com. We're going to move to two ballot questions this evening. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. Amendment 77 is the ballot question asking every voter in the state to let voters in three cities change the gambling limits in Colorado. A yes vote means you're okay with the voters in Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek voting on their own to increase gambling bets beyond $100 and to allow more types of games to be played. A no vote does not allow those cities' voters to make a change, which would keep the maximum bet at $100 and would keep the games to slots, blackjack, poker, roulette, craps, and sports betting. Since gaming is in the Colorado Constitution, all voters must have a say, but the gaming amendment is specific to Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek. That's why those voters will have a separate question on their local ballots asking to get rid of the $100 maximum limit and to allow their city councils to approve new games. If approved, tax revenue from gaming would be changed this way, 78% to community colleges, 12% to Gilpin and Teller counties, 10% to Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek. And community colleges would be given more flexibility in how gaming tax revenue is spent. In addition to financial aid, classroom instruction, and workforce development, community colleges could use the new money for student retention programs and degree completions. More than 3.8 million has been contributed in support of this measure. Want to gamble on where it comes from most? Casinos. Now to Amendment C, which would relax the rules for nonprofits to do bingo and raffle fundraisers. A yes vote reduces the number of years to three that a nonprofit must operate in the state to apply for a bingo raffle license. It also allows people outside of the nonprofit to operate the games and lets them get paid up to minimum wage. A no vote does not change current rules requiring a nonprofit to operate for at least five years before applying for a bingo raffle license, and it would keep the requirement that workers be unpaid volunteers volunteers from the nonprofit. Now we're going to fill in the bubbles. My favorite part, uh, they're, they're right near each other, C and 77, at least on, on my ballot. My favorite part of doing gambling stories and stories about the gambling towns is that Central City, we all know it is Central City, but we learned a few years ago, Kyle, that it's really just Central. It's the city of Central. I love that. Thank you, Marshall. America likes its transitions of power with a side of peacefulness. After President Trump refused to guarantee that, Senator Cory Gardner disagreed with him at our debate. A recommended listen for you on this issue that seems un-American. Next. The president should be crystal clear. Every single person in this country should be crystal clear. 
uh, there will be a peaceful transition of power. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Kyle said that that's the hallmark of our democracy. I think that's the exact statement that I put out. Uh, this is the hallmark of democracy, a peaceful transition. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And we will follow the Constitution. What we will do about it, we will follow the law. We will follow the Constitution. Republican Senator Cory Gardner in last night's debate drawing a distinction with President Donald Trump who's repeatedly refused to say whether there will be a peaceful transfer of power if he loses the election. Brings me to today's recommendation, some listening on this issue of peaceful transitions of power, which I think a lot of Americans take for granted, you know. I invite you to take a listen to Noah Feldman's Deep Background podcast on this issue. So Feldman's a Harvard Law professor. He interviews NYU politics professor Adam Shavorsky. He's an internationally known expert on how democracies transition power. You're thinking, that'll put me to sleep. I promise you it will not, okay? The most striking thing to me about this discussion they have is they discuss the president's reluctance to say he'll turn over power is that you don't really have a true comparison in American history so you have to look at what has happened in other countries, other countries with, shall we say, less than proud democratic traditions. Listening to the podcast that we have linked to on the next Facebook page may make you feel less than proud, but I promise it's worth your time. Heavy smoke plume over Fort Collins and the Front Range as a cold front drives south today. Winds over 100 miles per hour across Berthoud Pass out at DIA, Longmont, Boulder. Winds to 40. That smoke plume clearly evident as we do have poor air in the area. 80 today before the front moved in. 90 down south, but temperatures are starting to fall. Radar showing that smoke plume from the Cameron Pass and Cameron Peak area where winds continue to blow out of the northwest tonight. Red flag warnings in effect for west and southern southern sections of Colorado, an ozone alert for poor air here in the downtown area. But some relief coming in the form of higher humidity and cooler air. Denver under a frost advisory tonight, a low of 32, sunny and 57 tomorrow. A warming trend heading into the weekend. Another front, another cool down early next week. They work to help refugee families settle into their new communities when they come to Colorado. And we are going to help them make this state feel like home. That and your feedback next. Your word of thanks donations, $5 at a time, have now topped $900,000. This week, we are fundraising for Project Worth More, the nonprofit that supports refugees that are new to our community. If you text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, I will shoot you a link to donate. We are going to help make these folks feel welcome as our new neighbors in our community. Finish with your feedback, Michael writes in, welcome back to the Nine News studio. Guess you have to wear long slacks instead of shorts in your basement. Well, it was nice while it lasted. It was nice while it lasted, Michael, and I would also say that I refuse to believe that we have seen the last of the next fireside chats by the woodpile. James writes in with feedback on our debate moderation last night. He writes, I thought you gentlemen did an okay job. This is 2020, James. Okay is the new awesome. I'll see you next time. <laughs>